Good morning, Faith Fellowship. Happy Sabbath to each one of you. And happy Sabbath to our family online. We are always just so excited to know that we're going to be connecting with each one of you. Every morning when we pray before we begin, we are mindful and we are so grateful and we praise God for you, our family that is, is scattered all over this land, but we can be united to worship Jesus on this day. I am excited to talk about the revelation of Jesus Christ, a new series that I'm beginning, and I, I think it is so, I love that, you know, I just came from, from the message uh, series on signs and wonders, and the Lord is having me to continue signs and wonders in just a different capacity. And of course, uh, with the book that is written by none other than John. So it looks like we're continuing to um, follow John in his desire to reveal and tell about the greatness and grandness of our Savior. And I am just undone over and over again. I love how God does my life. I love how he teaches me. I love how he He just leads me. And I, and I pray that what he is revealing and showing and enlarging for me will bless your hearts. Now, the revelation of Jesus Christ, look at the last book of the Bible, Revelation, but but what is that? I mean, there is so much wrapped up just in those first few words. There is endless confusion today about who God is. And every religious system on this planet claims to have the truth about who God is. There is even the a, a blanket statement that is shared very often that we all worship the same God. That is not true. There is the God of heaven, the creator of heaven, that this revelation is all about. And his name is Jesus. From the beginning, before anything was created, the Father determined that the entire world would know who Jesus is before he returns to take his people home and that his identity would be known to the entire planet. And there is one thing that is crucial and that we're going to be looking at. Really, I'm focusing on one verse uh, out of the book of Revelation today. And it, it, it declares uh, who Jesus is and what the Father's intent is and the, just the importance of understanding that Jesus is an equal to the Father, being divine and being all-powerful and being equal in every way and that he is to be worshipped the way that the Father is worshipped. That is a foreign thought today on this planet. And it is going to take something absolutely mind-boggling to bring this to the forefront of every mind. Those of you listening, the majority of you are Bible students. And you study the prophecies in the book of Daniel and Revelation. And you have a, a, an understanding of what this is all about. But I'm here to tell you that God, no matter how many times you've read a passage in God's word, God wants to enlarge because he is so big. We can't be limited. If we feel stagnant and stifled, it's because our vision of God is small. And it's not growing because how can we be stagnant and stifled if we are seeing Jesus on a bigger scale and through new vision and new eyes? And so I'm hoping that as we go through this series on the revelation of Jesus Christ, that you will allow the Holy Spirit to put more paint 
on the canvas of how you see God. As we begin this morning, let's all stand together for the reading of God's word from the book of Matthew, chapter 24. Tell us, they said, when will this happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus said, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory, and he will send his angels with the loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Hallelujah. And today we are one day closer to that appointed time of the end. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what an incredible plan you've laid before us. It is so exciting. It is, it is absolutely beyond all that we can soak in at one time. And I know that is why we must have layers and layers. And thank you for being mindful of teaching us and feeding us and growing us one layer and one step at a time. We praise you, Father, for that this morning. And Jesus, we praise you for how faithful you are to the Father and to his plan. And sweet Holy Spirit, we are grateful that you bring these things to mind and that you grow them in our hearts and minds. And we desire to have a grander picture, to be captivated this morning once again with who Jesus is. And to bow our minds and our hearts in reverent submission to our Creator and our Redeemer. That is the desire of our souls so that our worship this morning would be found acceptable in the holy sight of the kings of heaven. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Most of the world has no idea that Jesus Christ is the creator of the world and that he created the world in seven days and that one of those days is holy space, holy time. The weekly cycle has been maintained since Jesus created it. From Adam and Eve, their first day on the planet was a Sabbath with Jesus. And here we are today, 2,000 years later, on a Sabbath. This weekly cycle that is an invisible phenomenon that exists only in our minds, that the Creator created for our good that we might mark off time and be obedient to what he's asked us to do. Incredible. The, the fact that Jesus is the creator is an absolutely beautiful and astounding fact because the creator steps down from his glorious throne and he becomes the word and he becomes the Lamb of God. And the Creator becomes the Redeemer, the one who lays down his life. We've just recently looked at all of that. And it is, it is so beautiful that God makes himself available and visible. All that the God family is, is wrapped up in the visible God of Jesus Christ. And the entire world will know one day soon that Jesus is the creator and that he is to be worshipped. And it is going to be more than the world can handle truly. 
But I love the end of the story. This is the beginning of the story, but the end of the story, Jesus says, I am making all things new. And so he is going to recreate the heavens and the earth. And one thing that is going to be astounding to us is that we're going to witness that. And I can't wait for the day when we get past this sin problem on the other side, living face to face with Jesus and with all of his people and with the family. And we get to witness and we get to see and have evidence. We by faith believe today, but you and I've never seen Jesus create. It is One of the things that captivates me about Jesus and so understanding that the Father intends for the world to know that Jesus is the creator, he is almighty God, he is the one who speaks, he is the one who we are accountable to because he is the judge and that one day all of that will be revealed to the world. Wow, that is what this book is about. And I know that there is so much being talked about and said about Bible prophecy today with all of the craziness of this planet. People are turning to want to study and want to know. He recently, people that I've never spoken to about Bible prophecy are interested and they're asking questions. And it's an exciting time to see people actually wanting to know and learn and grow. And I thought, Lord, I know that it's a time for us to go over this part of the story again because it is absolutely incredible. Now, the revelation of Jesus Christ and the revealing of who Christ is requires a, an attention-grabbing setting, a conspicuous setting. Can you imagine today trying to take this message to the world with, let's just, let's just think about for a minute where we are in earth's history today. Politics are out of control. We've just been through uh, the, the disaster of COVID and all that that brought upon us and, and a, um, an understanding of how quickly People are seized with fear, and I want you to remember that because that has been a very uh, eye-opening for many people that God's going to use again in a different way to bring, to get, to grab people's attention. Uh, Think about the church and where it is and how there is so much discord just within the church on things like transgender and gender identity and um and, and the gay movement and all of these things, many things that, that the devil is just stirring and that there is um, disunity about. Church, every day there's another church leaving uh, one of uh, assist, the system that they belong to. And from every system, this is happening week after week after week. The church is anything but united. And the church is not focusing on what should be focused on these little peripheral things that are not going to matter at the end. What matters is that we are living by faith and being obedient to Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so all of these things that are distracting the world, sexual immorality that that is plaguing the church, plaguing the world, the distractions to want and, and make money and be consumed with materialism and all of the things that people of this planet have turned into gods. God has to break through all of this somehow to get everyone's attention to reveal who Christ is before the end comes. Think about it for a minute. What a huge problem that appears to be for God. He has a huge problem on his hands. How to reach 8 billion people when this begins, when the revelation of Jesus begins to unfold for the purpose of the Lord subduing hearts 
and minds and to hear an incredible message that comes from heaven's throne. Matthew 24 says, For then there will be great distress. Your Bible might say, Great tribulation. Though many Christians don't have a clue, most understand that term. They've heard that term. Most of us have heard it in some way. The great tribulation. And, and what that is. There will be great tribulation, great distress. These are Jesus' words. Unequaled from the beginning of the world until now. And never to be equaled again. Do we take time to just absorb what this one statement is saying? It is huge. Before the revealing before Jesus can come in the clouds, there's going to be a great tribulation. And it's important that we understand why. It's so easy to go and get caught up in the trumpets or in the bowls or the appearing of the Antichrist and, and get consumed in one part of the story without knowing the backdrop. There is a stage that is going to be set for the revealing of Jesus, and that stage is the great tribulation. And you and I are going to, if we are alive during that time, we're going to witness this, that God says there is unequaled distress from the beginning of the world, not even the flood and the horrible things that have happened since then. This event is unequaled. And because you are Bible students, you understand that this tr time of tribulation and distress from the book of Daniel is 1,335 days long. There is much that God will accomplish. The Father has many things to accomplish in the unveiling of all that Jesus is before the planet for every person to decide whether they will submit to Christ and worship him or not. Because when it comes down to it, that is what this is all about. Understanding the why is crucial to being faithful and God being so big that our eyes will be fixed on him regardless of the destruction that's this level that will be all around us. When you understand what he is trying to accomplish, that God is, the Father wants us to know the goodness of the Savior, the lengths that he has gone to to secure eternity for each one, the humility of the Savior, which will be hard for many to witness when divine power is raging all around us and we've never witnessed or experienced anything like it. This time of the end is about seven trumpet calls, seven judgments, trumpet judgments, and I'm not going to go into them, but this is what this is talking about for those of you that have an idea of what the Bible says. For, for this time, I want you to understand that this time of disaster has a purpose. There is a reason for it. A God of love and of mercy will be revealed like never before. God's Holy Spirit power will be poured out on this planet like it has never been seen. And it will be the worst of times as we're reading, but it will also be the best of times for those that put their faith in Jesus it will be a time like no other. 
And that is what I want for us to look at, what God is trying to do, even though he is going to interrupt life abruptly. It will never be the same once day one of this time of distress begins. There will be no going back. There will be no business as usual. There will be no let's get things back to where they were. No, we will be rolling forward, counting the days off. They won't come quick enough because we will be looking for the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory to gather his people from the ends of the earth. What a day that will be. Again from Matthew 24, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm in his faith to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will, will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Take note that the gospel is going to be preached to the whole world before the end comes. This is another beautiful layer and another beautiful paint on the canvas of the picture of Jesus that I hope that you will have, that there is a purpose of why God is going to arrest the attention of the entire world with the biggest shock and awe campaign that has ever, ever taken place on this planet. It is going to be beyond anything because the message that God wants to get out is crucial. We must hear it. Those that live at that time will absolutely have to make a decision. And God intends that every one of his children living at that time be well informed, have clear evidence, and make a decision with all of the facts before them. The Bible is clear that anyone who is not a part of God's kingdom, refused to love the truth and so be saved. You can't refuse something you don't see. You can't refuse something you've not, you're not handed or you're not given. God will give everyone a clear understanding. And then each person will choose whether to accept it or not. This is a global event. And so we'll go to to Revelation 14. Then I saw another angel. Now John sees different things going on. He is seeing visions and he writes them down. And then he sees another vision and he writes it down. And he sees angels doing different things because God is painting something that is going to be for the people that live at the end of time that will need to understand that that is you and that is me. And so he's, these angels flying midair have the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. We just read that from Matthew 24. And who's going to hear it? Every nation, every tribe, every language, and every people. This is a global event and why God has orbiting angels. It's not that the angels are going to be yelling this out to everyone. This is a global event event and God is telling us that this message comes from heaven. This message comes from heaven's throne. This message doesn't originate on the earth. This message comes from outside of the earth and it's brought to the earth. So it's important that we understand what God is telling us through every verse and what is happening. These angels are giving a message and these angels represent the work that is going to be done by God's servant prophets, by those that tell the gospel message to every nation, to every tribe, to every language, to every people. Can you imagine taking a message to every tribe, and I love that, in every remote corner of the world, in the deepest jungles, 
on the highest mountains, in the deepest valleys, wherever anyone lives, God intends that every person hear his message. It's incredible. That is our God and his love and compassion and desire to save every single person. And what, how does that message start? The very first part. He said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, the springs of water. Wow. This is the first thing. This is an incredibly important message. At first reading, it's like fear God and give him glory. Isn't that what we're already doing? Apparently not. It is going to be retold. The message is being retold. And this message will offend billions of people. First of all, Jesus is not accepted by the majority of the world. And so when the declaration goes out to worship Jesus, the creator of the world, who isn't equal to the Father, that will be very offensive. But the fact is that the Father designed a test, this testing truth before Jesus comes to give us an opportunity to acknowledge that he's the creator and give us an opportunity to submit to God's authority and to whatever God asks us to do at this time. And surely God is talking to each one of us right now. Inside of this time of distress, everything's going to be different. Life as we know it will be gone. There will be destruction and death all around us. And God will have the attention and God will require the attention of every child because he desires to save each one, especially those who are offended. So I want to break this verse down and talk about the everlasting gospel because most people don't know what the everlasting gospel is. And it's very simple that the Father has determined from the beginning that Jesus will be worshipped as the Father is worshipped for all eternity. It sounds simple. Throughout all eternity, all creation will worship Jesus. Jesus is not worshipped today. That is going to change. We know that we're going to a place one day where every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. For those living during the great tribulation, during the great time of distress, at the revealing of all that Jesus Christ is, it will be required then of each person. And you and I will also, just because we are trusting God today, does not mean that we will stay unless we are maintaining our relationship with him every day. That time is going to be very difficult and it's problematic because the world opposes Jesus. The world opposes Jesus as the son of God. And billions reject the fact that Jesus is the creator of the world. And so God has an issue that he's going to resolve. And I want to remind us, if we go back for just a minute, that in heaven, this eternal verity, this eternal truth, the everlasting gospel was a testing truth because the day came when the Father revealed that Jesus was an equal to be worshipped and one-third of God's angel children refused to worship Jesus and they were cast out of heaven. 
And you also know that when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he wanted one thing that he still wants. He wanted it in heaven. He refused to worship God. He was cast out. And he tried to extract it from Jesus in the wilderness, and that was worship. Remember, he told Jesus, if you worship me, I'll give you this world. And so worship is huge because you and I will take a side and we will either worship Jesus or we will will worship Satan. That is what this is. As we unfold the story over the next several weeks, we're going to look at what God is trying to do in every way possible to rescue people from out of the hand of evil. Evil is filling this world. Violence fills this world once again as it was in the days of Noah. And Jesus says, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. We need to wake up, church, and be ready and have an understanding of what this revelation of Jesus Christ is all about. We can't just be in the mindset of we want Jesus to come and, oh, come Jesus. That is wonderful. But those of us that understand God's word need to be knowing it better so that we can share it with others and give others hope. And so that when this time of distress comes, that is going to make us all shake in our boots, that we will understand the big picture, that God is doing what he has to do in order to save as many people as possible. And he can't save people unless they're willing to put their faith in him and trust him and believe that he is who he says he is. It sounds simple, but it is the biggest story ever. It, it's an incredible, absolutely incredible unfolding and revealing that God will do during this time. Why are the, the trumpets going to happen? Why is destruction going to happen? Because Jesus is going to try to save as many people as possible. And in order for that to happen, we must know who he is. The world must know who he is. And the very first thing that, that is declared about God is that we must fear him. And let's think about that for a minute. When there, is, when there are earthquakes breaking everything down, when there are asteroid impacts and when there are tsunamis and when there are fires raging everywhere and there is disaster and destruction all around, it probably won't be too hard to fear God and to be afraid because the, the Greek word is be afraid. Phobeo, be afraid. In, in, the, in the realm of Revelation story in the eternal gospel, it's deep reverence and respect toward God, which doesn't exist today in most places. It's just, it's profound reverence. It's having the highest respect and devotion. And Jesus will send these divine judgments to reveal his divinity. Remember when he was here before and he walked this planet and he performed many miraculous signs to reveal his identity once again, he will do this on a worldwide scale to reveal to the world who he is through destruction and that we must fear him and exalt him. Fear God and give him glory. Think about what's glorified today. What do people give glory to? What are people praising? We think the word star is attached sports star, movie star, athletics, uh, all of these grand things that we praise and ooh and awe ah about. The call to give God glory is to recognize 
that everything that we have comes from him, that God is loving and good and kind, that he has a plan to save his people, and he alone deserves glory. So everything that has been glorified in the past, throw it off. World, money, power, position, politics, all the things that have been idolized and that are worshipped have got to go. Jesus is revealing himself. He is the creator of the world. The world is called to fear him and give him glory. It is he that has given us breath to live. It is he that deserves to be praised. And then worship him. Worship is a word that has so many faces. And we look at worship as, you know, we come to church to worship God corporately. But what is worship? Because ultimately, worship is a way of life. It's not a one-time thing. It's not something we do here or there on this day at this time. Worship is a way of life. And I think one of the most beautiful uh, scriptures that gives it in a in one sentence is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where we are told to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. This is our spiritual act of worship. If, if, if we put ourselves on the altar, then we are giving God every bit of ourselves. We are giving God our heart, our mind, our body. We're saying, Lord, I belong to you. I submit myself to you. I will live according to your will. Father, use me and everything you've given me, every talent, every gift. Let me steward it for your glory. That's worship. And from that attitude comes reverent submission that bears the fruit of obedience because faith bears fruit and faith reveals itself by doing whatever it is that God says. So when this call goes out to worship Jesus, it will set the world up to recognize him as creator, to go back and remember the creation week. And there will be a testing of each one of us, whether we are willing to submit to God's commands in whatever way he says, but specifically the fourth commandment, when we will be called to rest on the Sabbath day, a day that is forgotten because the creator's been forgotten. If you forget the creator, if you don't know about the creator, if you just have maybe many people won't know about the creator, but they will learn. But the church, those that know the creator, that know that God created the world in seven days and then he decided to take that seventh day and put it into the Ten Commandments as a, as a test of love, most Christians don't think that the Ten Commandments are even valid. So God has his work cut out pretty much all the way around to get each one of us to reset, to get the entire world and the church at large to line up with him and to be willing to do something that's going to solicit persecution from those that oppose it. Serious. It's not going to be enough to just say, oh, I love Jesus. I'm going to submit to Jesus. Jesus says, okay, now show me. Now show me. Resting on the Sabbath is an act of worship. 
The great tribulation is a stage for the revealing of all that Jesus Christ is, as we know in this book. He is so much more, and we will know so much more into eternity, but there are many things in God's word that we that will be just in living color. And Jesus will be revealing who he is, a God of love and mercy and goodness under the worst circumstances that could possibly happen on this planet. And so what is coming and the storms that are in the near future are going to be so incredible because of the message that will go out about our Savior. I can't wait for that day, even though I don't want to see destruction. I don't want to particularly live and, and experience that. I, you know, I, I live in the most comfortable time of Earth's history. And so for God to turn this world upside down, I, I give serious discussion in my brain with myself about how I will respond to that and whether I will be faithful to God in the worst of times. Knowing why this is happening gives me not just joy, but peace. And I hope that as we go through this series of the revelation of Jesus Christ and all that the world is going to hear about him and all that God is going to be putting in place to secure our eternal destiny forever is worth considering. It's worth hearing again. And it's the most beautiful, next to what Jesus did on the cross, which makes this possible, it is the most beautiful story. Revelation story, instead of being a scary story, instead of being doom and gloom, instead of being all of these things that people make it out to be sometimes, turns out to be another part of the greatest love story ever told. So may God give you new and fresh understanding about why he is going to do what he's going to do in the near future, why he is going to turn this world upside down, why destruction is coming, and why you and I have to be ready to listen to the eternal gospel as it is preached again one day very soon.